In August 1971, police raided a flat in Amherst Road, a quiet residential street in Stoke Newington. At number 359, they arrested four young people. They also seized an arsenal of weapons and bomb-making equipment. This marked the end of a year-long terrorist bombing campaign that had shaken both government and police. The bombers called themselves the Angry Brigade. In around 30 attacks, Angry Brigade targets included the Ford Motor Company and ministers in the Conservative government. They machine-gunned the Spanish Embassy and tried to wreck the National Police computer. They bombed banks, the Bieber Boutique and even the Miss World competition. We had the vehicle parked roughly with coaches here and come in the morning we found that during the night time somebody had come along and placed a bomb beneath the vehicle. I had left some pamphlets on the vehicle that was the Angry Brigade. Today, the Angry Brigade are all but forgotten, their bombs overshadowed by the IRA mainland campaign, which began a year later. And in the 30 years following their bombs, the Brigade and their supporters have maintained a tight-lipped silence, ensuring the full story has never been told. So who were the Angry Brigade? Jake Prescott became involved in Angry Brigade activities following his release from a prison sentence. There was no great meeting on Waterloo Station or anything, you know. It was a whole disparate uh, um, number of people in different locations, you know. So how did you come and meet the Angry Brigade? Uh, it's, you know, just about the same, I suppose, as everyone else met each other. Some through accident, some through, you know, um, having been at university together, some people have been in prison together. Um, it was just a, a process of um, graduating to people who were on the uh, extreme fringe, if you like, of um, political activity in, in London. It wasn't a brigade in military terms. It wasn't remotely like anything like Al-Qaeda with millions of people all over the world all communicating secretly and so on and so forth. Nothing like that. It was just a group of like-minded people who decided to go beyond the limits of legality to fulfil their political purpose. I don't think people were so angry, or they were pretty angry with the way society was running, especially with the war in Vietnam. I think more it was the impatient brigade, really. It was, it was feeling, oh, we must get on with it. We want to do something which, at a stroke, quickly, sharply, uh, uh, brings our, our, our protest into, bear, into, into the light. <laughs> This was the end of the sort of hippie, love and peace stuff for a lot of people. And you got much more politics. And politics builds up and builds up and builds up. Every group who had some kind of grievance was organised and was taking action. There, were, um, there was a lot of trade union activity. There was uh, people on rent strikes. Um, there was a students' movement. Um, you know, the women's movement take off about same time um, and so uh, you know people if they felt some kind of grievance they organized around it and it was international it wasn't just confined to Britain for most demonstrations and organized protests were enough but for some like Bader Meinhof in Germany and the Red Brigades in Italy there would be more bombs and bullets there's this idea that you can change the world. The world is not changing. It ain't changing by putting flowers down people's guns, as it were, or in America. It ain't changing by, by all sorts of things that the hippies thought. So things are getting much more hard-edged. And that's where we are at the time when the brigades start to emerge. I thought it was a way of um, getting s some message across, you know. Um, you know, some sort of punctuation in, in a struggle, really. Um, You know, it's some people saying that they'd basically reached the end of the line with, um, you know, a particular kind of politics that, you know, basically no one was listening. And, um, you know, kind of organised struggle would have to change in some way. Throughout 1970, small bombs had been used to target government property and businesses all over London. No one knew why. 
An explanation finally came in December, when an angry brigade communique claiming responsibility for the bombs was sent to the press. This detailed their support for a wide range of causes, the women's movement, anti-fascist groups and workers' rights. In order to draw attention to what they were saying, they set off a bomb, like you put an exclamation mark at the end of a sentence or whatever, make people sit up and look. Uh, and I think that was the uh, idea of it, you know, that they would um, sh kind of make their voice sound louder if they did that. So long as the activity had been against um, sort of institution, if you like, in, in a funny way, it seemed to make sense to me, you know. But, you know, the turning point was when actually real people came, you know, that, was, that it was revealed that there was actually real people. Um, that changed it for me, you know. It would be difficult to regard this bomb attack as just a gesture. Most of the ground floor of Mr Carr's large house is seriously damaged and few of the windows remain intact. On January 12, 1971, the day of massive demonstrations against the government's industrial relations bill, a bomb exploded at the home of Cabinet Minister Robert Carr. All our front windows had been broken and all the front of their house after the second bomb was in a terrible state. It must have been at the side, because that's the part, the first bomb, that's the part that was damaged. And the second bomb, well, my husband and Robert, they saw it near this part of the house here. I mean, just for the record, the day after the car, the, ro the, the bombings, two bombs, had gone off at Robert Carr's house. Now Lord Carr, he was then the Minister for Employment and Productivity. Um, I knew in my bones that the game was up. Do you feel an attempt was made, was being made to assassinate you? Well, if so, it was luckily a very clumsy attempt. Certainly anybody looking at my kitchen would think that the explosive was lethal. The car bombing kind of um, called my bluff in a way because up until then I had, hadn't really thought about limitations of things. The early bombs had barely registered in the press. This was a major escalation. But the fact is there had not been a bombing campaign of any sort on English soil for several decades. And that in itself shocked people. A communique claiming responsibility was sent to the press. Now the angry brigade were at the center of a huge police hunt. I think the police had, were simply going round uh, raiding all sorts of addresses up and down the country. Um, I think they were floundering half the time. And I don't think they, uh, I, I rather suspect that they didn't really know where they were going. Lost for a lead, the police began by raiding the homes of known left-wing activists and the underground press. One of the raids, led by Special Branch Sergeant Roy Creamer, was of the time-out offices. I'm here as a police officer to do a, a specific job. You can appreciate my position. How can I possibly say anything about it? You're dealing with something so remote, so fringy as the Anchor Brigade. Uh, you're driven into the, the very corners of uh, the political fringes, and some officers might have, you know, uh, thought it was odd. I mean, if you go uh, into anarchist communes and uh, ask questions like um, who's in charge, well, you'll be just met with laughter. The police's first break came with the arrest of Jake Prescott. By my actions afterwards, I got myself nicked, really, by talking about it to people. And um, I got arrested in Nottingham Gate one night about about midnight or something, with a whole batch of stolen this and stolen that on me. And they got an address book. That was so important to catch somebody. I mean, there's a kind of foothold. I could almost identify from Christian names, the surnames, when there's very few of them. So that was very, very helpful, but it only pointed us in the right direction. Jake was charged with the Robert Carr bombing and with conspiracy to cause explosions. Despite his arrest, the bombings continued. Another explosion and an anonymous telephone call to a news agency. 
With an attack on the Ford Motor Company headquarters in March, the angry brigade showed their support for striking workers. Each of the targets were symbolic. They all represented different facets of protest, anti-establishment uh, movements, if you like, um, and political movements. And here were a group of people willing to let off bombs on behalf of these causes. Erin Pitsy was involved with the women's movement and was shocked to discover that some of her colleagues were involved with the angry brigade. As a protest against consumerism, they planned to bomb the fashionable boutique Bieber. Where it really became real, I suppose, was there was this discussion in this general office. Quite a lot of girls were there. And some of the girls were smoking gitan, they were the blue French cigarettes. Because you couldn't get those in easily. And they were bragging about the fact that they'd been over to France and they'd been bringing back gelignite. And because at that point they were still there was the talking about the idea of bombing Bieber's. And I was horrified. I went to Bieber's with my two children and my son in a pushchair like all my friends. I just felt that it had gone far too far and I just said to them, if you go on like this, I'm going to go and tell the police. They just laughed at me. So I went back home, silliest, pick up the phone and say to Hamilton Police Station, I want to complain. But it didn't stop them bombing Bieber because they did bomb Bieber. Likelihood of being able to forecast where they were going to strike ne next um, didn't arise really. It was almost impossible. They were um, quite random. In June, another attack on a Conservative minister, Sir John Davis, further rattled the government. It was obviously an enormous embarrassment. The Conservative Party were being. Um, bombarded in different ways, literally. Uh, and uh, the order went out from politicians, get these people. By late summer, the net was closing, and more faces behind the angry brigade were about to be revealed. Here in Amherst Road, Stoke Newington, four detectives arrived in a van and went to the top floor flat in that house over there. Their raids were carried out with military precision. On August 21st, 1971, two men and two women in their early 20s were arrested. Over the next few days, four others were also charged. They became known collectively as the Stoke Newington Eight. For Jake Prescott, whose trial was about to begin, the timing of the raid on Amherst Road was a disaster. A week or so before our trial opened, they had, the police had raided Amherst Road and they had arrested various people and a huge amount of material. They then, at the last minute, if you like, brought all this stuff into my trial. So I hadn't seen this stuff. And they spent the first week showing the jury all this stuff, machine guns, berettas, bombs. So, you know, they didn't have too difficult a job. Jake Prescott had a, 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 a noctogenarian old QC defending him who normally did libel cases. And um, he never had a chance, really. I got sentenced to 15 years. And uh, after a farce of a trial uh, run by a man who, you know, a judge who had had a bomb threat made on him by the Angry Brigade, which I suppose is a sort of justice, isn't it? Um, so there we are. Although cleared of involvement in the Robert Carr bombing, Jake had admitted writing the addresses on the communiques and he was convicted of conspiracy. The severity of Jake's sentence caused an outcry and an unlikely range of people rallied to his cause. From their prison cells, the Stoke Newington Eight continued to prepare their defense. All were charged with conspiracy to cause explosions. The four from Amherst Road were additionally charged with possession of weapons. The allegation was that the police raided and found this stack of weapons there. The defence was that these had been planted by the police. My view was that it was much more likely that they were planted by the police than that they were found there, and there were a whole lot of reasons why that was, and all of those were put to the jury. 
frankly, I find it almost impossible to believe that, that my colleagues would do such a thing. I mean, they found some uh, most unlikely items there. The key thing for me was um, they found this aggregate stamp. It's one of these rubber stamps that you put on a pad, and, and they kept changing the number, like aggregate communique one or so on. And the scientists said, without a doubt, this is exact the same stamp as uh, has made all these others. So that alone, to my mind, was a complete um, proof that they were the Anger Brigade. The trial began at the Old Bailey on 30th of May 1972 to huge media interest. It was an unusual trial. The way people dressed, the way they came to court. I mean, you know, these were not people who were going to come to court in, uh, in suits and ties. It was quite clear that these were people who had uh, a, a different lifestyle from uh, that which was portrayed by the sun. The four who had lived at Amherst Road quickly emerged as the key defendants. John Barker had met James Greenfield at Cambridge University. Their girlfriends were Hilary Creek and Anna Mendelssohn. They were very political, they were bright, they were able to uh, um, conduct themselves um, effectively, efficiently, and I may say with a lot of dignity. Ian MacDonald defended James Greenfield. The other three took the unusual step of defending themselves. I think they decided that if they could speak to the jury direct and actually face the jury and speak for themselves, that they would be able to get their defence through more directly. Their desire was to vindicate the ideas behind what the Angry Brigade was doing, while denying quite properly that they were the people who'd done the bombings. John Bach's the kind of person that I think the jury admired, but they wouldn't necessarily, you know, he's that kind of person. And uh, the way, you know, he, he mastered the techniques of uh, cross-examination and so forth, wonderful. Uh, but this kind of warmth of the, of the man didn't come over. He was too cold and intellectual. The two women also held their own in the courtroom, but it was Anna Mendelssohn's personality that most impressed Ian MacDonald. I mean, of all the people who were, I mean, she had a charisma, very good voice, very good projection. And she could kind of embrace the jury, you know, and, and win them over uh, in a way which you know, someone in a wig, I couldn't do it. They were brilliant uh, advocates in their own right. Anna and Hillary came across very well in the closing speeches. Um, they were very sincere, and I think the jury really wanted to believe them. After six months of testimony, cross-examination and pleading, and nearly 700 pieces of evidence, the jury remained divided. In the end, they chose to convict four of the defendants, James Greenfield, John Barker, Hilary Creek, and Anna Mendelssohn, but acquitted the rest. They also called for clemency. I don't know of uh, any other trial of, of a serious nature as this, where at the end of the trial, the jury come back with a, a, a recommendation for, for leniency. I mean, that's unheard of in trials of this kind. There was an element of compromise. It's a bit like a one-all draw, that is to say, we weren't completely successful in what we wanted to do, nor were they. And, uh, uh, you know, it sort of evened itself. At the Old Bailey, there's the scales of justice that balance, and I think it was a fair balance. Because of the clemency plea, sentences were reduced from 15 to 10 years. The two women served five years and were released early because of ill health. Barker and Greenfield served seven. Jake was the last to be released, having served eight years. I'd done the time and um, tried to get on my life, you know. Um, came out, got a job straight away, worked, 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 worked. But um, I was never easy with what I knew was my role in the Robert Carr bombing, you know, and the, the part that I had played. Um, 
however insignificant or otherwise, you know. Um, so, um, you know, I'd always been bothered by a family in a house being bombed, yeah? Um, so I wrote to them, and not just to him, but his family, and uh, just spelled this out to them, you know, and said that, you know, if they ever felt like accepting uh, an apology, however late it might be, blah, 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 and, you know, I'd be, I'd be really happy about that. And, um, bang, lo and, lo and behold, comes back a, a really, you know, generous um, reply saying, you know, from Robert Carr saying his family discussed the whole matter and they were only too pleased to accept it and, uh, you know, wished you well and so on and so on. So then I thought that is that, you know, that is, of, that, is that now. There's a, there's a full stop after that now. Bit of punctuation. You can move on. Like Jake, who now works as a legal advisor, the women moved on. Hilary Creek lives in Europe working as a health counsellor and Anna Mendelssohn became a poet. Barker and Greenfield, however, returned to prison in the 80s for their part in a drug smuggling operation. So did the Angry Brigade campaign, which so affected their lives, have any wider impact? It's difficult to say that uh, this has had a lasting influence because it's intriguing um, and I think it cost a lot of people dearly. I rather suspect it's one of the movements that went up a cul-de-sac. These sort of terrorist attempts have never changed anything for the good. They've always changed things for the bad. Every time a terrorist goes out and does something like that, they make things worse because they unleash the worst forces of the reaction. Uh, and, and also they, they split and divide the best forces of progress. It was something that was of the time, it was a component of the 60s. How can you do the 60s without your urban guerrillas? Um, how can you do the 60s without your urban guerrillas failing? That also seems to be true. Fortunately, we could do the 60s without, without our urban guerrillas killing anybody, um, something that I think is rather in their favor. <laughs>